I want to talk about um, reigning in life. And this is part three, if you're taking notes. And I hope you all brought your Bibles or a notebook or something that you can write down because I want to get to the point where you're not taking everything I say. You can get the, uh, the video or the podcast to do that if you want to hear it again. Uh, and can I just say thank you so much for uh, all of those people that tune in uh, to our podcasts and our webcasts. Uh, and there are different people from all around the world that are now listening to these messages. So the message is not just reaching you. It's going beyond you into many other people's hearts. And uh, that is a, a wonderful privilege to be able to send out a uh, a message of the gospel that's not only reaching this house but reaching into the nations. So I want, to, I want to start by saying we need to deal with two things. One's revelation and the other one's praxis. That's a new word for a lot of you but it means my practical living of my revelation. A revelation is given when we come in to a relationship with God and we submit our heart to the work of the Holy Spirit as we yield ourselves, God starts to reveal the mysteries of the kingdom to us. And all of us can receive revelation. Literally in the Hebrew, it means to tear back the curtain and to present something forward. Like if that was a stage and the curtains were closed and I popped out, ta-da, I would be a revelation to you. <laughs> so Jesus wants to pop out, ta-da, and he wants to show you things that are already in his word. Now, revelation often comes through the illumination of the word. In fact, it's an apostolic prayer I'm going to end with. The apostolic prayer of illumination means that the Holy Spirit shines into your heart the spiritual truth of God's word. The spiritual truth of God's word. And there's a really important thing we're going to understand today, and I want to take you on a bit of a journey, is that revelation is not the letter of God's word. It is the spirit of God's word as truth being shone into your heart so that it may shift your present pattern of thinking to come into God's pattern of thinking. And when it does that, it produces life. Now, the way we build our life is from the spirit revelation through the word into actions of faith so that the revelation comes to dismantle a mindset or pattern of thought and a present belief system to come into a belief system that causes action. We have this idea in the Western church that the church is about creeds. It's all about what I believe. But that's unknown to the Bible. As you believe, so you shall live. In other words, belief produces an action. It's incongruent to say that I follow Jesus as you follow the world. 1 John says, if you're the lover of the world, then you're an enemy to God. You're flowing against the things of God. The problem is the world has become so much a part of our soul and our heart, we have to recognize what it's doing to us as we embrace the word of God. And there's a wrestle in every single believer between the old pattern of thinking and the Christ thinking that comes through the word. So you will feel a little bit like, I know that's God, but I want to go back the other way. I've, I have unbelief in my belief. Who's ever experienced that? Yeah. Steve Hess, thank you for your honesty. You. Who's understanding what I'm saying? Yeah. Who's ever felt like... So let me, let me give you the, 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 the most topical one, and I'm not asking for money, but it's always... Money's a big deal for all of us, it seems. Right? Would I, was that fair? Yeah. All right. So God says... You know that tithe, that, that 10%, you get, I want you to up it to 20%. But you're not, you haven't got any more income coming in. Now what are you going to do? There's going to be a wrestle in your heart, isn't there? There's going to be a wrestle in your head. And you're going to go, but that makes no sense. And God says, that's my promise. I want you to sow to a promise that is bigger than the pattern of your ability to earn money. I want to bless you beyond your ability to earn it. But I want you to sow into it. See, that's Abrahamic promise. But we get caught up. That 
makes no sense to us. Hang on a second. God, I don't actually believe that. So what's the belief system we respond to? I'll withhold. So we don't give. God comes around the mountain again lovingly and he says, hmm, all right, I'll ask you again, but in a different way. And he keeps going on until he exposes in our heart what is tethered to the world or what is tethered to the spirit and him, to the truth of his word. So faith is in the subconscious mind, it's in the heart that attaches itself and draws from the power of the spirit of the word because it is truth and it is life. But it will confront and offend your intellectual present way of thinking. So faith is higher than present carnal knowledge. And we can't understand the things of the spirit through the carnal mind and the flesh. So I'm going to talk about some of those things this morning because I want us to get an understanding of how it is we can be empowered and powerful to rule and reign in life, to take this grace gift that God has given us in Jesus Christ and allow his promises that are yes and amen, to allow the blessings that are already established in him where you are seated to be transferred into your life and operate through your life to touch the lives of others. It's not just about you being blessed. God wants to to reveal the reality of his kingdom, his promises, his blessing and his life in you so that it can flow through you and that's how he establishes his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. But we have to have a healthy understanding of the word of God. The word and the spirit work together. They're not separate. They work together. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. They are real food to nourish your spirit man, to nourish your heart, to nourish your soul. Why? So that you may have a life that's above the bondage and the patterns of this world. Amen. That's where freedom is for all of us and that's where our power is. So, God's design of humanity is living in right relationship with God by faith. We are to live from the unseen realm or the heavens to earth. Now in our natural mind that doesn't make a lot of sense. But the scripture is replete with that very idea. It's a fundamental idea from Genesis to Revelation. So therefore true spirituality is the ability to take that which is eternal as truth and life and cause it to be established through our life and our works of service as co-laborers with Christ. So what we take, we are to establish. What is to be put in our heart is to be out worked. What does Paul say about this grace gift of salvation? Work out your salvation, not work for your salvation. Work from God's grace, work from the finished work of the cross, work from the gift of life that's been given to you, establish it in your heart in the fear of the Lord. Because you're to work it out with fear and trembling, not fear of man, fear of the Lord. Why? Because it's the most precious thing you've ever been given. It's greater than anything, any material prize, any reputation you can have on earth. It's greater than any of that. And if we, our life is caught up with our reputation before man rather than our reputation before God and the heavens, guess what? We will shrink back into something that Satan can control rather than what God can release. Is there an amen in the house this morning? So we have to make some real decisions about how we're going to think, how we're going to live, how we guard our heart and how we don't guard our heart. Because I'm going to show you that as Adam and Eve were called to steward the Garden of Eden, Jesus uses that as a picture to say that is the territory of your heart. In other words, Adam was called to do something with the grace provision of God. He was to till it. He was to cause it to be protected and he was causing it to Increase So that which was in the garden would cover the whole earth. So it is with your spirit and your heart. You are a three-part person. Let's go back to Thessalonians to establish it. 
1 Thessalonians 5.23. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now I know Daniel spoke about it last week, but I've been asked by a lot of people just if we can massage some of this in again so that we can get a firm understanding so we can go and live it out. Is that alright with everyone? I'm sorry if I'm repeating things, but you know what? When I watch Paul's letter to the churches, he repeats things over and over and over again. Do you know why? Because we often don't get it the first time we hear it. The first time we hear it, it's going into our spirit, but our head says, what the heck is that about? You know, like when you listen to me, what the heck is that about? But I'm feeding you spirit. Your mind will catch up. I know that. Then after a few years, maybe 10, <laughs> you say, wow, Paul, I got what you were talking about 10 years ago. The penny dropped. Well, I hope the penny drops this morning and it brings a few dollars with it. Yeah. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now Daniel spoke about this dualism idea last week and it's something I've spoken about in this house before. There is an idea in Pentecostal circles that my spirit, man, is all that I need to worry about. That my soul is not the important thing and as long as my spirit is perfect, then my life is perfect. Now, that is partially true, but misleadingly wrong. The truth of the matter is that there is a promise that you come into in Ezekiel, which I'll take you to right now. Let's have a look at that. Let's have a look at Ezekiel. I'm all over the place. I had such a flow that I wanted to give you. No, I'll come back to it. Ezekiel talks about this promise because Israel's heart was hard. Hard heart was a stubborn heart. It rejected the words of truth of God. And it wanted to go the way of the world. So in the soul, there were set up idols and they were worshipping other truths and other gods. Now, today, in our soul, can we worship other truths and other gods? Absolutely. The problem is that the soul when it's dominated, informs the heart. Our true order of how we're meant to live is spirit through our heart to our soul and our body. Spirit is connected to the heavenly places. Your spirit man is designed to be both seated in heaven and on earth at the same time. The problem is that your spirit man operates in your unconscious mind. An unconscious mind means exactly what it means. You're not conscious of it. Is that fair? So if I were to say to you right now that your spirit is not contained within you, but it is within you. It's beyond you. Your spirit man is not confined to you. Because it's also seated in heavenly places, in another dimension, in another heaven. So you're in the third heaven and the first heaven, multidimensionally, right now. Yeah. Now who can understand that? This is a mystery of the kingdom. Yeah. Paul teaches the church to say, you can't understand these truths from a worldly point of view. It, only the Spirit can show you these truths by revelation. No amount of study in your carnal mind will get your head around this. It's got to be revealed to you in your spirit man by the Holy Spirit through the word of truth. Yeah. With me? Yeah. So that spirit man, when they had sinned, man was operating spirit, soul, body. How many of you have ever felt the mood somebody is in before you even say a word to them? Oh yeah, let me tell you, there's a funky mood going on. You know, you walk up and the face is happy. You know, the face is happy, but you're getting this, mm -mm, mm -mm. there's argy-bargy in the spirit. Do you know what that is? It's the realm 
of your soul that is projecting from you. Now, when Adam was before God and Eve was before God, God understood them spirit to spirit. So hence he would say, where are you, Adam and Eve? He wasn't saying, where are you? He's saying, I can no longer identify with what I once identified with. I identify with you spirit to spirit. I am a heavenly God. I am spirit and I've put my spirit in you so that I can identify with you so I can put my name in you and you can reveal me to the world. The spirit man is designed to navigate God and the heavenly realms. Someone say amen. amen. Are you getting me? But when man fell, he made a decision in innocence. In innocence, to choose not to listen to God's word, thereby rejecting the relationship between him and God, them and God, and choosing to listen to the serpent in the garden, which was deceiving them. Now, here's how the deception took place. Remember the phrase, you shall not surely die. And we always think that Satan is actually misleading Eve. That's not the, if you go back to the Hebrew, what's happening is Eve thinks, if I eat the fruit, I'm going to immediately die. And Satan actually tells her the truth. He says, no, you're not going to immediately die, but you will later die. And that's what happened to humanity. That's what God was actually saying. He wasn't saying you're going to immediately die. He said, you will miss the ability to have eternal life with me. And what happened was that the soul got activated from a place of innocence to a place of deception and the soul came up through the decision and the spirit man shrunk back behind the soul. So the soul veiled the spirit man and now influenced the heart of man. Does it make sense? Yeah. So God says, hey, where are you? I deal with you spirit to spirit. Where are you, Adam? So there was a disconnect spirit to spirit, life to life. Now, here's the good news in Ezekiel. Through the prophet Ezekiel, God foreshadows through salvation that he will put a new spirit and a new life in us. He'll put a new heart in us. He'll remove the, st- the heart of stone and he'll give us a heart of flesh. That heart of flesh is important because the heart of flesh is receptive to the spirit man and to the Holy Spirit. He reconnects us through the redeeming power of his blood back to the place we were when Adam was in the garden, spirit to spirit, life to life. Hence, Jesus could say, these words are real food. They are spirit. They are to nourish you. They are to keep you. Now, the measure to which you keep the word, guard the word, establish the word is like a seed. So you're not instantly whole. It's a journey. You've got to learn how to be whole in your spirit, man, through the Holy Spirit, and allow your heart to be submitted to the Spirit. And Jesus teaches the parable of the sower in the Gospel of Matthew, and he talks about the heart. Now, I want to say this. Jesus talks about the heart more than anything else. There was an administration of God's spiritual truths through the law. We need to understand this. That God was giving revelation through the giving of the 613 mitzvot or commands. And then he reestablishes his ordinances in Leviticus, in the priesthood, and in the way in which things were to be administered until... There was an until. It was a parenthesis. Now, the reality was that there was a priesthood before the law. There was a relationship before the law. I don't have time to go into that. But the administration of the law was to reveal the words of God so that externally hearing it, they could change their heart. 
But God says, there comes a time where I'm not going to do it through the external word. I'm going to put my words in your very heart and I'm going to change your heart and I'm going to put my spirit in your spirit so there is no difficulty with you being able to hear me, respond to me and outwork me. That's regeneration. That's what regeneration of the spirit is. But it starts, Jesus says in the parable of the sower, like a seed. Peter says the word of God unto salvation is sperma. It's a seed. But how I develop the seed, all smirking, big boys and girls. Sperma carries blood and DNA. You're born again from above through the power of the word, which is spirit and is life. The same truth that comes to you that you can be regenerated is the same truth that keeps you, establishes you and finalizes you. Do you get that? In other words, we can't choose the word of God that we like and we don't like. So we flick through the Bible in the New Testament because now God speaks through his son and his words are life. He's not speaking through Moses. He's speaking through his son. Hebrews tells us that. He now, he once spoke through the prophets, but now he speaks through his son. Really important because the son reveals spiritual truths to your spirit man so that your heart can be established in the word of God. And Jesus said, there's four conditions of the heart. Remember the the first condition? When the word goes out and there's no understanding, it goes on the side of the road. It's a bit like concrete. It's a hard heart. And the word just bounces off. Then there's another heart that when testing comes, it hasn't taken root. Now, why hasn't it taken root? Because we haven't acted upon the revelation and established its roots in our heart. You have to act upon, continually meditate on the word, that truth as your reality for it to not only break off the old pattern that's informing your heart and demolish it, but to establish you in the new pattern of faith. Is everyone with me? So it's, I, I act on it. So what happens is testing comes. Who's been tested in the word? Oh, I have. I have. There was a time when um, I was on staff here in the church. We were a lot smaller and we didn't have a lot of money. In fact, it would be fair to say that we weren't getting paid. <laughs> and Tracy said to me, the credit card is not faith. I said, that's a fair call. But I like the safety of that kind of faith. So what was God teaching me? Faith into his provision. The Lord gave me a dream. And in the dream, the harlot came to me and tried to seduce me into, back into worldly ways. The next day, I received a phone call to receive a brief that would have cashed me up to all the money that was owed to me. Now, that seemed logically quite a blessing. Who's ever approached issues like that? That's a blessing of God. But he gave me a dream to be wary of something. He told me, don't go back under the world system. Why? Because he knew what was coming. He gave me a faith position through a dream to trust him when everything in my heart that was attached to the world was saying, this must be the blessing of God. And then I prayed and the Spirit of God said to me, Paul, remember the dream, make your decision. Now, was God going to write me off? No. He was trying to develop me. He was trying to grow me. He was trying to get me into a place where I could trust him for even bigger things. And I thought that was a pretty big thing. Who's ever been tested like that? Oh, come on. Provision's a big thing. So the person rang me up and said, are you available? And the Spirit of God said, I'm not 
available. This spirit response came out of my mouth before I could ratchet it back. You, you ever been there? You've said something, you're going, where on earth did that come from? And I was stuck with my answer. And I went, oh Lord, Father, I'm going to trust you. Your spirit is saying something to me that my head doesn't understand, that the worldly ways that are still in me can't comprehend, but I'm going to trust you at the power of your word, and you've given me a warning dream. I'm going to trust it. One week later, somebody blessed this house. All the money was restored to the elders. I have sat in a prayer time where I've asked to pay... And I'm not saying we're broke, okay? I'm just trying to give you an example on a real issue that we confront where the Lord where I've gone to the person I said can we pay wages this week that's how we lived can we pay wages this week no okay I'm going to go and pray with the elders so I took the elders and we went in to pray and as we sat and pray I said Lord I want your answer about provision you've promised you've promised provision if you said if we will seek first so I held the word of God before him I went into a vision I saw money streaming into my hands. And I said, all right, boys, stop trying. I've got the answer. The money's done. Everyone looked at me like I was mental. That's not unusual. <laughs> now, I couldn't have come to that faith confidence unless I'd passed the previous test on relying on God's word. So I now knew there was provision in the bank. We'd been in there 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. I wasn't hucka shuckering. I just held the promise of God before him. He took me into a spiritual answer that hadn't yet manifested. But as soon as I acted on it by faith, I went back to the person that was to pay the bills and I said, can we pay the bills? He said, I just told you. And the money. I said, look again. $10,000. Pay the bills. Pay everyone. You're all stunned. What I'm trying to say to you is you will be challenged in the testing to see what is actually grounded in you and what's not. Does that make sense? Then there's the third kind of soil of the heart where the word is in there and it's got a root but it can't bear the fullness of its fruit because the worries of the world start to choke it. Who's had worries of the world? You've trusted in the word, you've walked by the word, and now the worries of the world start coming against you. And yet there's a command from Jesus to preserve the condition of our heart, and he says, do not worry. Now, you, you know why he says do not worry? Because it's completely inconsistent with the word of God. It's complete. Now, I'm not saying be reckless or careless. But I'm saying, when you're overwhelmed by fear and worry, what it will do, it won't get rid of the word of God that's been planted in your heart. It will restrict its fruitfulness in your life. So we can see the heart is territory, isn't it? And how we feed it, how we nourish it, how we take care of it is really, really important. But most of us don't allow our spirit man to influence our heart because it's in the un conscious part of our world. We're not even aware of what our spirit man is doing. Do you know at night your spirit man is engaging God? That God will often speak to you and do things in the middle of the night because it's the only time the busyness of your head is so put aside that he can actually deal with your spirit man and your heart. See, we are, we are so busy we are so busy living in the world trying to get a break and it reminds me of the Egyptians under the rule of Pharaoh. You know, when they wanted to go and worship God, and let me tell you, this is going to ramp up. So I'm speaking prophetically. What, one of the ways in which the world, through this prince of the air, wants to rob you of your destiny and for you to become all you're meant to become through your salvation is to keep you distracted and busy and hurt. Distracted, busy, and hurt. And he will trade through that. And so you remember the story of Israel? When God comes and he wants to worship, they want to, oh, you want to worship God? 
You want, to go to, you want to go to church on Sunday and worship? I'll cause a shift to take place so that you've got to choose. I'll get you to work a Sunday shift. Why? Because I know how important money is to you. I'll create a distraction. I'll pull on something that I know you're bound to that is necessary in your life. Who's been there? Anyone been there? Or I'll create this distraction. Or I'll create that distraction to get you off of the word of God that's been spoken to your heart to bring you life and development that he's calling you to steward. So when Israel said, no, we want to worship God because we want to make him a priority. Although we're in bondage of the world, we're going to worship God. Pharaoh decides he's going to ramp it up. Now, not only do you have to make more bricks, you've got to go and find the material. Oh, who feels like that? It's the strategy of the spirit of the world to keep you away from the word of truth in your life. To put in your heart the briars and the thorns of the world to keep you in a place where you're confused which way you should go. Yeah. And God delivers them from the bondage of Egypt, which is a picture of the spirit of the world and its system of mammon. But it doesn't happen automatically. There's a process. And in fact, the first generation, although they were delivered, they couldn't renew their mind because of what was in their heart. What was in their heart was dictating what they pursued. And God had to wait for another generation who had seen the power of God move in their life, had seen the reality of the words that were being spoken through the prophets and the power of the law, the power of the promises actually being established. So in Numbers 13, 12 representing government, leadership of the community, get to a point where they're to go in to the promised land. And they missed what was in the promised land. Do you know why? Because of what was in their Heart. Hang on a second. God's brought us out here to kill us. No, he hasn't. He's brought you out to develop you, to make you a people of faith, to possess a land and to possess the promises. So only two could recognize what was actually going in on the land of promise. Guess what? God's brought you into the land of promise in Jesus Christ. The land that you have to till, to cultivate, to fertile, make fertile with the word and your affections is your heart. This is the power of worship. This is the power of worship. What does John say? What did Jesus say from now on? Let me find my text. John 4.24 God is spirit, and those who worship him, here's the imperative word, must. Must is an imperative word. Does anyone know what I mean by imperative? It's a direction. It's not if you feel like it. It's not if it's all going well. It's not if all the promises are fruitful in your life. It's saying every day of every moment of your life, whether you feel like it or not, you are to worship the Lord your God in spirit and in truth. He doesn't say worship God according to how you feel, your emotional condition or anything else. In other words, he's saying you cannot worship God successfully through the unredeemed soul. You worship God with all of your heart, but it's through the spiritual connection of the spirit man to where you're seated in heavenly places. See, where you're seated changes your point of view. But you have to understand that the spirit man is engaged with that world to give revelation to your heart of what is going on beyond your conscious mind. Does that make sense? Your soul, when it's under the influence of the spirit, is designed to radiate your mind, your conscious mind, your will, your emotions, your imagination, and 
your intellect is to come under the order of your spirit man and the Holy Spirit. That way Christ rules and reigns in our heart through the power of his word which is spirit and is life. The truth is spirit and life. You're to worship him from your spirit man informing your heart so it's a surrendered heart informed by the spirit man flowing through all of your emotion all of your affections and all of your body when you are truly engaged in heavenly worship you will not be locked up because that realm is more powerful than the realm that's locked you up Oh my goodness me, your worship in spirit and truth re restores your heart, brings the power of God into your heart, restores your soul, your injuries, your physical body, your emotional body. If you will just worship God, he will heal you. Can I have an amen? amen. But our worship is not based on that because we miss the understanding of the text. So today's worship is how I feel. Well, I'm not feeling today. I'm all locked up. I've had a really bad night. I had one too. But I get to make a decision. Who will be king in my heart? Yeah. See, I get to make that decision, not anyone else. I can't make you make that decision because then it's not your decision then you're not ruling and reigning. You're just coming under submission to my instruction. That's not being powerful. Being powerful says, I'm going to make a decision today that I feel like junk. I was going to say another word, but I can train myself. But despite how I feel, my praise will be a sacrifice where I learn to be an overcomer, where I learn to rule and reign my heart, my destiny, my future, and the only place I'm going to get free is in my praise of my King, His truth and His reality. And when I minister to Him, it unlocks a ministry of heaven to me, not only to me, but flows into the lives of everyone else that might not be able to do that. Oh, come on. You see, that's why we spend so long in worship. People go, why do you spend so long in worship? Enough already. Just get to the Word. You can't understand the depth of the Word unless you understand the depth of worship. The depth of worship opens your heart, your spiritual man, so you can hear the spirit of truth into your heart and be transformed. It's not a warm-up. It's our expression. It's our participation together to use the tools of understanding that our redeemed spirit, soul, heart and body has access to. That's what Hebrews is all about. So there's power in the Word. There's power in our worship. There's a faith position we need to occupy in our hearts and our minds. Does it make sense? No. I can't understand heavenly things from a worldly point of view. And I'm going to leave Corinthians until next week. I think you've had enough for this morning. Lots to think about. Lots to chew on. Who's encouraged? Who's being built up in their holy faith? Wednesday night, I'm going to teach about how we study the Word to gain illumination and revelation. And we're going to start dealing with the practical things. And then next week, I'm going to come back and I'm going to continue to unpack what Paul teaches the church at Corinth. And then how practically we can actually get in touch with our spirit man and start to learn how to navigate life from the spirit through the heart and our soul into the world. Amen? Amen. Bless you. Let me pray for you. Father... We thank you. We are on such a journey together as the whole body of Christ. And we thank you for your grace that enables us to live beyond our present understanding, to receive your word of truth, to be good stewards of that seed in our heart, to protect it, to guard it, to nurture it and to live from it.
And Lord, I pray for hearts to be transformed this week. I pray for the power of your grace and your Holy Spirit to simply renew our mind, our conscious mind, and the mind of our heart and the mind of our spirit. That, Lord, you would just transform us, that we would come back again with a hunger and an appetite to sit and know the Word of God, that we may know you. That we may read the Word, not with the letter of the law, but looking for the spiritual dimensions that nourish us and keep us and establish us. Lord, let your grace surround us. Let your angels go before us, come alongside of us, and hem us in. Let your promises be our hope in Jesus Christ this week. Lord, cause a mighty people to raise up in love and faith and touch the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you. See you Wednesday.